entitled Give Something. And um, next month we'll be starting our new series called Under Pressure. And we're going to be looking at some of the men and women of the Bible. Next week, as we talk about under pressure, we're going to be looking at the prophet Daniel. He was a man that was under some intense pressure. We're going to see how he handled it. And and when we look at how these people handled pressure, we're going to uh, see how the Lord is speaking to us about dealing the pressure in our lives, different circumstances. But right now, we're going to close up with um, give something. I want to open up with reading Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. And these are Jesus' words. Um, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give. So right away we see in the context uh, of this verse that uh, the giving here is of of a different type of a nature than we're used to hearing that word give. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word, Lord. You have not hidden things from us, Lord, but you have revealed them to us. Even as your word says, uh, Lord God, that the secret things belong to those to whom he has revealed them. And Lord, you've revealed them to us in your word. And so we're asking you right now, God, just to continue to open up our eyes and to see, Lord God, what we give, and Lord, to let our hearts be changed with your forgiveness and with your love. Continue to move in our lives, Father, as we look to you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first week we looked at uh, give something, give yourself. And we, we looked at that from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, how they not only were desiring to give of their finances, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. It's a powerful message. Uh, It was on January 7th. And the second week, Pastor Ron uh, talked about give something eventually, and he really expounded on Luke chapter 6 and just did a marvelous job. Uh, I would recommend any of you uh, listening to it and just allowing God to speak to your heart. Last week, we talked about giving your first and your best to the Lord. Um, that a sacrifice had to be unblemished and perfect. Deuteronomy 17, verse 1 says, You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect, whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. And, and so we saw how also that, um, you know, that he, Malachi tells us, would you, would you have offered such a gift to your governor if you wouldn't give something blemished that is, you know, isn't perfect to your governor? Why would you give it to me? You know, God wants our first and our best. And uh, last week we said, give something of value. You know, when David was going to sacrifice to the Lord, Ornan said he was going to give it to him. Give it. You know, I give it to you. Take it. You know, but David said, no, I will not sacrifice to the Lord uh, sacrifices that cost me nothing. He said, I will pay the full price. And we also talked just about dealing honestly with one another. You know, God is looking for us to have uh, honest measures, honest weights. You know, don't, don't have a, one that you know, is heavy and one that's light, one that's you know, specifically set to cheat other people. He says, don't do that. These are the ways that we, you know, we honor God and we show God that we're giving something of value by the way we deal with one another you know, in business and in our everyday lives. And it's not always easy being a Christian, is it? But all we have to do is follow him. And so this leads right into, giving something of value leads right into today's message, give something pure. Give something pure. So I want to read from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and listen to what uh, John records for us. He says, six days before the Passover, so this is six days before Jesus is going to be crucified. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Wow. So they gave a dinner for him there, and Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard And anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. 
The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. And we just see here just a, a beautiful act of, of love that we sang about in two different songs this morning. I have to be honest with you, I, I planned this text before well, probably last year, oh, a year ago. <laughs> Nobody's laughing. Okay. I, it's only January. And, okay. So when you have to tell your, yeah, a year ago, I planned this last year. Is there any place to hide around here? Oh, there's a nice little cross over here. Right? But, you know, and again, you know, the, the message was called Give Something Pure. And yet Karina and Ben pick out these songs about Jesus, we love you. You know, our devotion, our affection poured out on the feet of Jesus. And then, and then I, the more I seek you, the more I find you. I want to sit at your feet. This is the picture that we have right here. This is Mary. She says, it says, but Mary, therefore, took a pint of expensive ointment from Purinot and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Well, before we just look at Mary, though, briefly, I want to look at Judas here for a moment. Because there's something about Judas that we, that we want to see, and, and, and we need to see it in each one of us. You know, because Jesus, I mean, Jesus, Judas was just like us, wasn't he? And he was chosen by Jesus to be a disciple. Uh, Jesus handpicked him. And the first thing we see about Judas is that Jesus put him in a position of trust. Interesting thing, isn't it? Jesus put Judas in a position of trust. How do we know that? Well, it says that he had charge of the money bag. Judas was the one that was in charge of the finances. He was put into a position of trust. And every one of us is put into a position of trust. Every one of us. God has entrusted something to you. I don't know what that is, but you do. And if you don't, it's, it's just, it's not really that difficult. It, it, it just look around you. Look at, you know, your circle of influence. Every one of us has a different circle of influence. People that we have contact with every day. People that we rub shoulders with every day. Uh, that's part of your trust. Your families is part of your trust. Your church family is part of your trust. And then, and then there's also gifts and talents that God has given. That's like the whole parable of the talents. God gave to one ten, he gave to one five, and he gave to one one according to their ability. And then he said, go and, and use them. And, I, and, you know, and, and some of them did and some of them didn't. But every single one of us has been given a position of trust in some way. Every single one of us has been given a gift. You know, and we read about the gifts of the Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, 13, and 14, we read about the gifts in Romans chapter 12. We read about gifts in, in Ephesians chapter 4. And there's many other places that it just talks to us about. You know, I, I love the story about a holy ab and, a, and, a, and a, I can't remember his name, his name now. These two guys, <laughs> Bezalel. Bezalel and Aholiab in the Old Testament. God filled them with the spirit of wisdom to be able to perform in artistic designs. He'd given them a gift. They were specifically handpicked. I want these ones because I've gifted them sp specifically an artistic design to do these special things. God has given us a gift. He's given us a trust. He gave Judas a trust. What's the next thing we see about Judas, though? Judas fell under the temptation of his trust. But Judas, one of the disciples, he was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. 
having charge of the money bag, his trust, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So the very thing that the Lord was trusting him with was the very thing that he struggled with. You know, think about what your gifting is. Oftentimes, you know, it's the thing that you're really good at, the thing that you're praised for, that it becomes your downfall. The thing you're really good at, the thing you're praised for can become your downfall. Someone tells you you're so good at this one thing and you just mean to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Will was sharing a verse with me this morning from Matthew 23 about those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. So we need to really be careful too, don't we? Because the devil just, he knows. He knows our weaknesses. You've been given a gift and you're going to be tested in that gift. And that's not something to be afraid of. It's just something that we need to know. And sometimes, you know, the gift can be something that, you know, it's not something you do. It's just, you know, beautiful people. That, that's it. That's, is that a gift? We as Americans think it is. But that can become such a curse to people. Because everyone's always telling them how wonderful they are, how beautiful they are. And they begin to believe it. Happened to my son, Joel. Sorry, Joel, I love you. But it's, it did, you know, when he went into modeling. Everyone always telling him how great he was, how wonderful he was. He fell into a trap. We all want to be great and wonderful, don't we? But just know that whatever you're great or wonderful at is an area that uh, probably going to be the area of your strongest temptation. This, it was for Judas. He, he fell under the temptation of his trust. He put himself first. Not Jesus. It's so easy for us to do that, isn't it? Putting ourselves first. And then look at the next thing. Judas considered Mary's excessive giving a waste. You know, if we don't have a deep love for God, our giving to him in any way will seem like we're wasting our money with something, you know, it could have been used for something spent much better elsewhere. Why should I give to the church? Why should I give to the Lord? You know, I could use this money to pay off this bill, or I could use this money to stack away for a vacation. I could be going here. I could be going there. I could be doing this. And I, got, I have to give, you know, 10%. You know how much money that is? I could spend it somewhere else. You see, when you don't really have a love for God, that's how you're going to look at it. Look what it says. He says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Sounding spiritual, doesn't he? A lot of times when, when, we, when we're, we have a point of contention with the Lord, we can start to sound spiritual about it. and It's amazing. He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He used to help himself. The word means he used to lift. He used to like, like the, we get the word shoplifting from it. He used to just take things from it. But what a contrast we see in Mary. Just a complete different picture. In Mary, we see love's extravagance. Now, now look at Mary. Mary took the most precious thing she possessed, and she spent it all on Jesus. Why? Because she was in love. A pure love. Do you know that you can love from a pure place? Gosh, so much of what we call love in America is lust. It's not pure at all. But she was loving from a pure place. And it was real love. It's what the Bible calls agape love. It's the love of God. It's, it's really... It's, it's, only God can love that way. You and I, because of the fall, because of our sinful nature, we can't love that way. But when we give ourselves to Jesus, he helps us to love that way. What 
One commentator said this, love is not love if it nicely calculates the cost. Love gives its all. And love's only regret is that it does not have more to give. That's love. Wow. Lord, I want to be like that. Just fall in love with Jesus. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand. Sit back against you and breathe. Feel your heartbeat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. It's overwhelming. This love of Jesus. Mary spent it all. You know, 300 denarii, that meant that 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 nard was worth about a year's wages. So take one year of your wages and just throw it away. If you're from Judas' perspective, that's what you're thinking. She threw it away. What a waste. What a waste. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Mary's love, secondly, was full of humility. You see, it was a sign of honor to anoint someone's head. When you anointed someone in their head, you were honoring that person. But Mary knows her place. Hebrews 7, 7 says this, It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. Now, that verse is, in context, it's talking about Abraham, you know, when you think about it, of all the people in the Bible, you know, Abraham was the one who believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And you think Abraham is the one and that this was referring to Abraham blessing somebody. No. It's referring to Melchizedek blessing Abraham. And it says, and it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In other words, he's saying here, Abraham was inferior to this one. Melchizedek was the superior, and he was the one that was blessing Abraham. Some scholars think that he, he, Melchizedek might have been a, a theophany, an appearance of God in, in the form of man. Others disagree with that. It doesn't really matter. The scriptures are telling us that Melchizedek was the greater because he was blessing Abraham. And Mary knew when she stood before Jesus who was the greater. So she didn't dare anoint his head. It it reminds me of John the Baptist. Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized, and he says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? I'm not even worthy to, 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 to take off the sandals off your feet. And Jesus said, let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness. So this is Mary. She's, she's, she knows that she's not the one that's to be honoring Jesus. Jesus is the one to put honor upon her. And so she takes the, the, the place of the servant. It was the servant's job to wash the feet. So she takes the ointment and she anoints Jesus' feet. She knows her proper place. She's a, she comes and she's in love and in humility. She takes the place at Jesus' feet and anoints his feet with the oil and wipes his feet with her hair. That tells us something else about Mary. Showing us again how pure her love was in this instance. Because in that culture, to unbind your hair, (laughs) that's what the prostitutes did. It was a a symbol of disrespect or it, it just was not the right thing for a woman to do. But at that moment, and you know, this is what, you know, I love Titus 1.15. It says, to the pure, all things are pure. And at that moment, she didn't care about that. She needed something in her hair. She just used it to wipe Jesus' feet. It was pure offering. There was nothing sinful about it. There was nothing evil in her heart or in her mind. It was pure love and devotion for Jesus. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, and we're going to ask this question now as we close. Where are you today? Where are you at with the Lord? Which one of these two people better characterizes you?
To answer that question, we need to look no further than, of all places, the tithe. When someone who is walking in these truths that we've been talking about in loving Jesus, will they be tithing? The answer is yes. And they will be doing much more than that. When you're really in love with Jesus. See, is this said to people to bring condemnation? (laughs) Absolutely not. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not. I'm not judging or condemning anyone. I'm just simply stating a fact. That when you love, you give extravagantly. And this is not to condemn someone if you're here today and you don't tithe or you don't give. I'm not condemning you. I don't condemn you. You know, like Pastor Ron was explaining, we understand sometimes that's a very difficult thing to do. And what I'm encouraging you to do today is to fall in love with Jesus. Because the only way you're ever going to give from a pure heart is when you're in love with Jesus. It's not going to be because some preacher is, you know, telling you, you know, you're, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that, or, you know, if you give this, God will give that to you. No, that's not what it's about at all. Does God bless those who give? Yeah, he does, but that's not it. It's love. It's what it's always been all about. God's love for you and your love for him. I want to sit at his feet, drink from the cup in his hand, sit back against him and breathe. I want to feel his heartbeat. If that's your heart this morning also, just stand with us and let's close by worshiping the Lord and just committing ourselves first and foremost to just fall in love with Jesus all over again, afresh and anew, and let his love that overflows in your heart lead you and guide you in this area of giving something.